Hello, and welcome to the video launch of my new novel, uh, The Artist Spoke, just uh, recently released. In fact, so recent, I don't even have my author copies yet, so I'll be uh, sharing from and reading from uh, the uh, proof copies. It's actually available in uh, three different editions. There's the hardcover, uh, there's a paperback edition, and then there's the Kindle edition. Each is, is a little bit different from the other, uh, one of the things that uh, makes the hard copy, uh, hardback copy, a little bit different is that it includes uh, color uh, reproductions of some of my own photography. And uh, the uh, paperback has the pictures, but they are in black and white and uh, somewhat cropped. And then the Kindle edition uh, is just the text of the novel. It does not have the pictures other than the cover image, which is part of the series as well. I refer to it as my Chicago uh, images, uh, which I took uh, in Chicago uh, in uh, January 2019. Uh, so they are, are kind of throughout the book to introduce each of the six sections of the novel. So The Artist Spoke um, is a work that uh, I uh, worked on in, in uh, you know fits and starts, as I say, for a number of years, about five years or so. And then... Uh, Last spring, around uh, April of uh, 2020, I uh, finally finished a, a complete draft of the novel and uh, went about uh, revising. And then um, uh, finally this fall, I felt like it was ready for the world. So as I say, it's uh, now out there. And um, so what I want to do is uh, read a little bit from the beginning of the novel just to give you a little bit of a flavor of what the uh, book is about. Um, I've actually written a, a preface for the book, which is online. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if you go to uh, uh, tedmorsey.com, you can uh, access that or just uh, you know search for the artist spoke Ted Morsey preface and it should pop right up. And um, in it, I, I discuss a little bit about the, the history of writing the book, but also some of the things the book seems to be about from my perspective, at least, uh, but of course, uh, you know, that's really up to the reader uh, in large part to figure out what the what the book is about, because they have to bring their own reading experience, and their own experiences in general to the process, etc. So um, the, the book is a little bit of a departure for me uh, in the sense that it has a contemporary setting. Uh, my other books uh, have had uh, historical settings for the most part, and um, uh, I tend to like to work uh, in a past setting, for one thing, it's uh, it's definitive. We know kind of what happened and what technologies were available and, and that kind of thing. Whereas in, when you're working in the present, um, things change so rapidly in our world that uh, it's kind of hard to keep up sometimes. Like, for example, when I started writing this, I anticipated it would be maybe even a little bit futuristic in its setting. But uh, lo and behold, we're in the midst of a pandemic now, which is one of the reasons why this video launch is necessary. And uh, so that was not anticipated in the world of the novel. And uh, I kind of contemplated about whether I should try to somehow incorporate that into the narrative and just decided not. So um, so perhaps it is a, a pre-pandemic world that I have, I'm writing about, which pretty much eliminates it being a sort of futuristic setting. But nevertheless, it is what it is, and uh, it is out there in the world. Um, I did want to uh, uh, pay a special uh, thanks to uh, the podcast 42 Minutes that uh, interviewed me about the book, along with uh, my interest in the novelist uh, William H. Gast and, and the, uh, the project which I spearheaded over the summer regarding the 25th anniversary celebration of Gast's novel, The Tunnel. So you can find that uh, podcast out there where I talk about all that stuff, including, like I said, uh, the artist spoke. So uh, again, what I'd like to do is I uh, give a brief reading from the book, uh, though I will begin. I want to read the acknowledgments section because I think acknowledgments are always important. And, um, and I think they're especially important for this book. And so it uh, says, Excerpts from the artist spoke appeared in the following journals in different form and usually under different titles in Floyd County Moonshine, in Lakeview Journal, Adelaide Magazine, uh, Central American Literary Review, and Lidbreak Magazine. 
I wrote this book in fits and starts, often losing my way, at one point abandoning it for nearly two years. The editors who saw something of value in the work and published pieces of it over time provided more encouragement than they can know. It is not an overstatement to say the artist's book is their book too. All books are made of other books, but perhaps this one more than most. So much so, it's impossible to acknowledge all of its sources of inspiration, but I must name its fountainhead, Shelley Jackson's Skin. All right, so uh, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to read the acknowledgement is because part of what this uh, novel is about is about uh, the sort of writing that is published in little journals for the most part, in fact, almost entirely. And so little journals are, are a really important part of the literary scene today, uh, as they have been since their inception. Uh, but their role kind of keeps changing and uh, their impact kind of keeps changing over time. But uh, I thought it important to acknowledge uh, the little journals that publish parts of the book because I really was feeling my way along and, and not at all certain what the book was really going to be about. I, I started uh, trying to write the story years and years beforehand. Uh, I sometimes try to write it as a story, uh, sometimes as a novel. Uh, then, like I said, in maybe late 2015, I, I, I got another sort of idea about how to get into the story. Uh, and I did think of it then as a short story that I could maybe knock out in a month or so and then uh, move on uh, with some other projects. But as so often happens, it sort of took on a life of its own. It wanted to be longer than a short story. And so it ended up being a short novel. Um, some may call it a novella. That's a whole nother issue, which we talk a little bit on, about on the 42 Minutes podcast. But I certainly think of it as a novel. And as I said, it took about five years in the writing. And so those uh, editors who saw fit to publish a bit here and a bit there, uh, even though I was not completely sure in what direction I was going, their interest and maybe confidence in, in what I was doing uh, certainly inspired me to keep going and to figure out where I was and where it was going to end up, et cetera. So thank you to those editors who, uh, who took a chance and uh, published those little bits of the story along the way. So um, as I said, the, uh, the artist spoke is uh, in uh, six sections. Um, they each uh, begin with a photograph uh, of, my, of my own. Um, they have a, an epigraph from a different author and they each have a, a title of their own. And so uh, I'm going to read a little bit from the first section, which uh, I have titled The Isolation of Conspiracy. And that was actually kind of the working title of the whole project. Uh, but then ultimately I, uh, I decided to go with uh, uh, the title of um, one of the final sections, The Artist Spoke um, for the whole book. It seemed to uh, really be more of a, a a, a statement, a title that was appropriate to the whole work. I do have a, an epigraph from Shelley Jackson to open the, the first section. And it says, uh, yes, it was a burden. That thought did cross my mind. There were other things in life, but once the egg had come to me, it was impossible to imagine a life that didn't contain it. And uh, I know uh, Shelley Jackson you know, is referring to a lot of different things uh, in that reference. But one of the things that uh, it means to me is the, the artistic, uh, you know, idea that comes to one, whether one is a writer or a, a painter or a composer or a choreographer. And once you get that, that idea, um, it, it, about the only way to put it to rest is to write it out, paint it out, dance it out, whatever it might be. And so even though I was somewhat lost and, and, and muddled in what this book was about, it, it never left me. And uh, the only way to really uh, exercise it um, from, from my psyche was to somehow finish the book. And so I eventually did. So again, this is from the very first section titled The Isolation of Conspiracy. And it is uh, from uh, the artist Spoke. And here I go. The author was dead, and not in a Bartesian sense, actually truly dead. At first he thought it was a hoax, maybe even one begun by the author herself. All manner of wild theories flashed through his head. He was on a train speeding through winter empty fields and tiny towns that appeared equally empty beyond the flashing crossing signals that blurred by his window. 
The train's Wi-Fi was spotty, probably due to the snow that was falling across the Midwest, a late storm that no one had predicted until a few days before. So he had difficulty trying to verify the tweet from uh, at Northern Iowa Lit, which said, a small plane carrying at Elizabeth Winter's author has crashed, no survivors, hashtag Eliz Winter's revelation. When he saw the alert, he instinctively touched his left shoulder. He had the idea, but only for an instant, that the tattoo had vanished the moment Elizabeth Winters expired, if the tweet was true. It was the sort of thing that could happen in Elizabeth Winters' fiction. For the final hour of his ride, he fruitlessly attempted to get additional information. Entering the city, the train crept through a series of tunnels and beneath overpasses of steel, rendering his devices all but useless cut off from the signals that seemed to fall from space. When he arrived in the city, the station was packed and had the frenetic energy of a mall at Christmas time. He brought only a backpack, which he slung over his shoulder, and he was able to maneuver through the crowded halls with relative ease. He thought he'd lost weight in recent weeks, and it was confirmed by the fact he had to hitch up his jeans every so often. There seemed to be an inordinate number of mothers with small children pulling their own colorful luggage, which would impede his progress until he could excuse himself around them. Another significant impediment, a group that must have been attending a medieval fair or something, they were gracelessly trying to maneuver through the crowded station while carrying blunted lances, pennants, decorated shields, and tall cone-shaped henens with trailing veils. It was ridiculous but he felt sympathy for them even in his irritation. When he'd applied to be part of the author's latest literary project, he imagined Katie would apply too, and he envisioned their getting their words together and coming to revelation together, forever having that common bond. But Katie was unimpressed by the author's project and had no interest in applying. She called it grandstanding, not writing, and said she was a publicity hound, not an artist. He liked to think that was the first sign of trouble for them. But while picking his way through the travelers and their wheeled luggage, trying to reach the escalator, he acknowledged there had been other suggestions, other hints. Signs or not, Katie had moved back to her apartment a month ago, and in the last week they'd only texted twice. The final exchange didn't include the customary endings, Lumu, that's L-U-M-U, -U, love you, miss you, and Lumu too. A coffee shop on the upper street level nearly drew him inside with its fragrant appeal, maybe some aromatic African bean. He resisted, though, anxious to reach his hotel and hopefully find further news of Elizabeth Winter's accident. In his rushing, he nearly ran into a woman, a mother, who had stopped to bundle her daughters against the cold, two little red-headed girls, identical twins, it would seem. All three looked at him like he'd intruded on a private moment, there in the very public space of the train station. In the queue outside the station, waiting for a cab with snow falling from the colorless patchwork of sky between tall buildings, he heard a woman mention the author's death. He looked back along the line but couldn't identify the speaker, maybe the blonde in the white coat. He had a room at the Livingston Hotel. It was still a few hours before revelation at the university that was Elizabeth Winters' alma, ma alma mater. There was little to do but wait. He felt the heaviness of his breakup with Katie grow heavier, like each falling flake of snow added a measurable weight to his blue mood. And if he stood still long enough, he would be buried, a snowman of angst. A taxi for him pulled to the curb, and he got out of the storm as quickly as he could. The woman at the Livingston's front desk told him how fortunate he was because his room had a view of the lake. But when he pulled the cord hand over hand to raise the room's blinds, white snow light flooding in, all he saw were buildings and the long, busy thoroughfare. Vehicles, including many yellow taxis, moved in a continuous line through the slush. The snow obscured his view, yet not enough to hide an enormous lake, which must have been to his left. He moved a very neo-deco chair, work his own orange leather and blindingly bright chrome, so that he could get in the corner of the room next to the picture window. 
If he put his face against the cold glass and strained to see as far to the left as humanly possible, he could view about an inch of marine gray lake. So the front desk woman wasn't lying. His guess was she'd never tried to view the lake from number 824 herself. Otherwise, she wouldn't have reported his good fortune so cheerfully. There was free Wi-Fi in the hotel lobby. He unpacked his tablet and went down to search the web for more details of Elizabeth Winter's alleged death. He was strangely unaffected by it, perhaps somewhat in shock, perhaps in literal disbelief. The Livingston's lobby was essentially a single large room with the registration desk tucked into one corner, a coffee kiosk in another, then a bar and bistro taking up about half the area. There was a large fireplace, large fire currently roaring, a pair of red bays, billiard tables, and mismatched chairs, sofas, and ottomans, mostly in leather. It was the epitome of a cozy and eclectic setting. It affected the vibe from an earlier age of an inn for road-weary travelers. He purchased a glass of beer and sat in an overstuffed club chair. A window offered a view of the continuing winter storm. The web now had numerous reports of the crash, a small private plane in a remote spot in northern Iowa. Even some major news outlets had picked up the story, but they were all reporting the same dearth of details. A few offered a makeshift obituary, avant-garde author, winner of the Calvino Prize for experimental fiction, actually one of her most traditional pieces, originally from Evanston, Illinois, lived in Santa Rosa, California with her longtime companion. A couple of sources described her as wife, Marion Tate, who also perished in the crash, it was presumed. Most of the stories included that Elizabeth Winters was traveling to reveal her latest work, a 753-word story known only as the project's title, Logos Alive. He took a drink of beer and felt his shoulder through his shirt and sweater. He'd learned of Logos Alive from a student in his Tomorrow's Great Books seminar. They were reading Elizabeth Winter's o Orion. I'm sorry, Orion. Orion is a town near where I grew up. Mispronunciation. So it's stuck in my head. So they were reading Elizabeth Winter's uh, Orion, her novel structured according to the principles of astral navigation, which she had also published via mathematical language broadcast into outer space from the Hat Creek Observatory. Rumor had it that the Hat Creek edition had an epilogue which totally recast the mood of the novel in retrospect, but the epilogue wasn't available in print on Earth. The joke in seminar was that Elizabeth Winters could either spark an alien invasion or, or avert one. What other author could boast of that sort of influence? His seminar student had been checking out Elizabeth Winters' website before class and saw the CFF, the Call for Flesh. She was requesting 753 participants who would have a word, in some cases a word plus punctuation, tattooed on their body, location, point size, and font dictated by the author, and also allow a subcutaneous chip to be implanted. As soon as class ended, he went to his office and completed an application to participate. According to her website, Elizabeth Winters had written a short piece that 753 people would be part of word by word, only the bearers of the story would be given access to the narrative. He'd always felt at a loss at not knowing the alien's epilogue of Orion, and he didn't want to be left in the dark on Logos Alive. There was no explanation for the purpose of the subcutaneous chip. He received a news alert on his phone that amended the earlier crash stories. Elizabeth Winter's companion, Marion Tate, was alive. She had flown ahead to prepare for revelation. Marion Tate's only comment posted to the author's website was that revelation would proceed. He switched attention to his tablet but found nothing further. He was keeping his phone close because he was hoping Katie would text to see if he arrived all right or to say something about Elizabeth Winter's accident, but there was nothing. He wanted to text her to pretend that he was just letting her know the news in case she hadn't heard. He knew, however, how pathetic that would be. I bet you're a Logos. He turned in his chair, and the blonde woman from the taxi queue, the one with the white coat, was standing there, the white coat draped over her arm. Sorry, I didn't mean to snoop, but Elizabeth Winter's, Winter's photo jumped out at me. The news story he'd been skimming had a portrait of the author uh, from the Orion jacket. 
Elizabeth Winter's red hair is swept from her face and she's looking back at the camera, almost a smile on her red lips. It's okay, and yeah, I'm a Logos. He patted his shoulder. The woman touched her hip. She was wearing a gray wool skirt and a darker gray turtleneck sweater, black tights and boots. She was attractive behind a pair of glasses with blue frames. She was holding a drink, something amber like whiskey and water. There was a ring on her left ring finger, which may or may not have been a wedding ring. The lobby had been filling up and there were only a few open seats, including the chair adjacent to his. Would you like to? He gestured toward the chair. She hesitated a second before folding her coat over the back of the chair and sitting. She placed her drink on the small side table between the angled chairs and offered her hand. I'm also Elizabeth, but go by Beth. Hi, Christopher. Chris. Her hand was cold but soft. So you're staying here? I had them take my luggage to my room. I hate to sound like an alcoholic, but I really needed to have a drink and take a deep breath. I'm a little in shock. I can't believe she's gone. It doesn't seem real. I know that's cliche, but it really doesn't. I know, he said. With her flair for publicity, I keep thinking it's a stunt, hoping, I guess, especially given the timing, but that'd be cruel of her. It was noisy in the lobby and they had to lean toward each other to chat. Beth sipped her drink. She glanced about the lobby. You think most of them are logos? Maybe, I suppose we'll find out in a few hours. It is just a few hours away, isn't it? This isn't what I expected. This, mor this mood of mourning, it was supposed to be a celebration of literature, of art, of life. It may be yet, his voice held little conviction. Thanks for offering me a sit, she said. I'm going to my room to freshen up, as they used to say in the movies. She stood with her drink and gathered her coat and purse. Maybe we can share a cab when it's time. Great. He looked at his phone. So we can meet in the lobby at three? Three then. They exchanged numbers in case it'd be useful. Then Beth headed toward the elevators. He appreciated the fact her coat was draped over her arm. He began composing a text to Katie. He'd arrived on time in spite of the storm. Had she heard about Elizabeth Winters, but deleted it. The triteness of how Katie and he met was almost embarrassing. She was his teaching assistant, but they were close in age. She was a bit older for a grad student, having taught junior high English for three years before quitting to work on her master's, and he had completed his doctorate and found a tenure-track position in the bare minimum of time. Katie finished her degree with a specialization in rhetoric, and the university offered her a contractual job teaching first-year writing. They were suddenly colleagues, and they started seeing each other in the fall. They'd been all but living together for a while, but Katie had kept her efficiency apartment near campus, mainly for appearance's sake, or so he used to think. Looking back, it was his suggesting, all right, maybe pressuring a bit, that she give up her place and move in with him in earnest that perhaps began the fissure. The argument over Logos Alive didn't so much broaden the fissure as shine a bright light that revealed its depth and breadth. One might say that he overreacted to Katie's rejection of Elizabeth Winters and her project, but he read it, even at the time, as a rejection of him, of them. So in that context, his reaction was just about right. He swallowed the last of the beer from his glass. He thought perhaps he should go to his room and rest before revelation. Instead, he ordered another glass and pulled up one of his favorite Elizabeth Winters interviews her rain taxi interview from a few years before. The waitress brought his beer and he settled in with the author's wit and wisdom and the thing he admired most, her artistic courage, her risk-taking. She said in the interview, I don't have much use for writers who play it safe. What's the point of telling a story that's been told a zillion times in the same way a zillion other storytellers have told it? Around him, there was the accoutrement of babbling voices while billiard balls cracked together like unbreakable eggs colliding on the crimson bays. But he sank into the words of Elizabeth Winters, trickling across the quiet pond of his tablet. And I will stop there. So again, um, that is uh, the opening part of The Artist Spoke. Um, Again, it is uh, available in three distinct versions, the hardcover edition, the uh, paperback, and the Kindle edition. Um, 
And once again, uh, thank you to uh, 42 Minutes Podcast for uh, talking to me about the book. I'll put a link to that in the comment section of this video. But uh, thank you for tuning in and listening to a little bit of The Artist Spoke. Certainly uh, contact me and you can find my email address at tedmorsey.com. If you have any questions, uh, I would certainly be happy to, uh, to autograph a copy of the book and, and send it to you. The um, hardcover edition is a little bit pricey, especially since it has the color photographs. Uh, so I'd be happy to uh, give you a, a, you know, a nice discount um, uh, for an autographed copy. So uh, go ahead and email me if you are interested in that. Otherwise, if you're interested in uh, buying the book retail, um, I would encourage you to uh, check out its availability at independent bookstores, which are really, really struggling during the pandemic, and they would certainly appreciate the business. We must keep literature alive and keeping independent bookstores going is a big part of that. All right, so uh, again, thank you for, for tuning in, and uh, I'll look forward to hopefully hearing from some of you.